the sky was filled with gray colors and intense fog. Stormy clouds loomed on the horizon, and visibility was minimal. To make matters worse, the rain started dropping to the point that even snow flurries began to blend in with it. Nonetheless, the four-man crew of Project Gemini made its way from Ellington Air Force Base, Texas, to its destination at Lambert Field in St. Louis, Missouri. The weather was not expected to change throughout the day, so they ventured forward anyway. Astronauts C and Bassett were flying in one Northrop T-38A Talon jet trainer. Stafford and Cernan, the backup crew, in another one that followed the lead aircraft through the storm. The crew could not see beyond a mile away as they approached the landing zone at Lambert Field. But they had to figure out a way to do so, as the weather began to deteriorate quickly. The pilots were too far down the runway to safely land. Stafford and Cernan opted for a missed approach procedure and climbed straight ahead to make another instrument approach. C and Bassett decided to continue the landing attempt on their first pass. They sustained their left turn, angled the aircraft towards McDonnell Building 101, and the fatal accident occurred. Realizing their sink rate was too high, they turned on the afterburners and tried to perform a sharp right turn. The T-38 jet hit the roof of the McDonnell building and crashed into a courtyard nearby. The loss of the two young Americans was a tragedy that changed American space history forever. But it could have been worse. If they had made the maneuver just an instant earlier, they could have brought down the entire building and all the Project Gemini crew working inside it would have buried the American space program for a decade. The end of World War II gave way to decades of swift technological advancements. When the Allies took over Germany, they discovered astonishing technology programs and studies German scientists had done during the Third Reich. Many of those top secret projects ended up in American and Soviet hands. The Cold War that followed World War II was an age of violence, espionage, and most importantly, technological innovation. Mankind's dream of one day reaching space was only possible to Americans and Soviets the victors of the conflict, and the new economic powers. Nuclear bombs, supersonic fighters, helicopters, colossal warships, and many other innovations were developed back-to-back -back with aircraft capable of one day reaching the moon and the stars. During the arms race, the U.S. and the USSR were also eager to take the trophy of sending the first man to the moon. In the early 1960s, the USSR had the upper edge thanks to the Sputnik program's successful satellite launches. In 1961, Soviet triumph rose to global recognition when Yuri Gagarin became the first human to venture into outer space. Aboard the Vostok 1 capsule, he completed one orbit of Earth on April 12, 1961. It seemed that the US could simply not keep up with Russia. Project Vanguard, SCORE, and the launch of the Explorer 1 passed unadvertised and were deemed a failure by many experts. Committed to winning the space race, the U.S. created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, in 1958, and destined a significant amount of money to develop a successful space program. Additionally, to truly demonstrate American superiority, the government approved a classified program named Project A-119, which had the objective of detonating a nuclear bomb on the moon. The program was eventually canceled because the government concluded that landing a man on the moon would attract more global attention in a more amicable way.
Project Mercury was the direct consequence of Russia's successful Sputnik program. To recover American morale, the government created the first U.S. human spaceflight program. It ran from 1958 to 1963. After Yuri Gagarin's successful mission, the U.S. launched its first astronaut, Alan Shepard, on a suborbital flight on May 5, 1961. Months later, on February 20, 1962, Project Mercury concluded when John Glenn made three orbits around the Earth. Project Gemini was the follow-up of Project Mercury. It was born in 1961 and ended in 1966. The program's objective was to develop space travel techniques necessary for NASA's most ambitious dream, the Apollo mission, whose purpose was landing a man on the moon. The project received support from President John F. Kennedy, who was committed to land an American on the moon before the USSR. Nonetheless, with the worldwide hysteria reaching a breaking point during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 and the assassination of JFK the year that followed, the space race momentarily faded from the public perspective with the approaching Vietnam War. In November 1965, the Gemini 9 crew was integrated by Elliot C. and Charles Bassett. Their backups were Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan. Their mission was scheduled for May 1966. Gemini 9 was tasked to conduct a three-day mission that would demonstrate rendezvous and docking within the Gina target vehicle. The mission would end with Bassett himself performing an EVA, or a spacewalk, using an astronaut maneuvering unit, known as AMU. The foursome crew trained hard to get physically fit for their mission. Cernan would later write, quote, Before long we grew Popeye-sized forearms. Elliot C. and Charles Bassett were considered novice or rookie pilots because they had no previous NASA mission experiences. However, that did not mean they weren't qualified. C was a former General Electric pilot who always had a fascination for aircraft and decided to pursue his aviation and engineering career. In the Navy, he acquired the rank of Lieutenant Commander when he left Naval Reserve duty. Bassett belonged to a military family. He enrolled in the Reserve Officers Training Corps as an aviation cadet and graduated in 1953. He eventually went to Korea with an 8th Fighter Bomber Group and tested every USAF aircraft at his disposal. He was selected for astronaut training in 1963. The crew of four was highly qualified for the program that would lead the US one step closer to landing on the moon. On February 28, 1966, all the effort put into the project was almost jeopardized for one sudden and lamentable accident. On that February day in 1966, under severe weather conditions that included heavy rain, fog, and limited visibility, a pair of slim Northrop T-38A jet trainers took off from Ellington Air Force Base in Houston, Texas. C and Bennett were in the lead aircraft, followed closely by Stafford and Cernan. Their destination was McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis, Missouri, where they were going to train for two weeks in rendezvous and docking procedures. When the Gemini crew approached the landing zone, C radioed Lambert Field Control Tower and was told that visibility had dropped to just 2.4 kilometers. As the two airplanes descended through the overcast, the crew realized they were too far down the runway to land. Stafford decided to take another approach, while C chose to keep the field in sight, and he circled to the left to land on his first pass. 
as C and Bassett's airplane vanished from sight. Stafford barked, quote, God damn it, where's he going? The rain was heavy, the sky was gray, and they never saw C or Bassett again. Just seconds later, they would crash. For a moment, Stafford and Cernan circled the field, waiting for the Lambert Field air controllers to answer them and clear them for landing. But no response came from the control tower. Abruptly, he heard over the radio a strange question, quote, Who was in NASA 901? Puzzled, he answered, quote, C and Bassett. He was then cleared for landing. When he and Cernan opened the canopy after landing, James McDonnell himself, the founder of McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, was waiting for them. After a formal salute, McDonnell told them, quote, they're dead. He explained to them that C and Bassett were gone forever. Stafford and Cernan could not believe it. Their fellow friends had crashed attempting to land. Although the loss of the two brilliant men was a tragedy, things could have gone worse. Much worse. If Season Bennett's T-38 had been a little lower when it hit Building 101 at McDonnell, it would have penetrated straight into the assembly line, destroying the Gemini 9 and Gemini 10 aircraft, and killing hundreds of McDonnell spacecraft construction workers. Tom Stafford, in his book We Have Capture, wrote, quote, Had they hit a couple of hundred feet earlier, they would have hit the side and roof of the building, instead of just the end of the roof, and wiped out the whole Gemini program. If that had happened, Project Gemini would have been over, and the American chance of one day reaching the lunar surface would have seriously deteriorated. Instead, only a dozen workers were hit by debris, with no casualties and no permanent infrastructure damage. On March 4th, the crew and astronaut corps gathered at Arlington National Cemetery to watch as Elliot McKay C. Jr and Captain Charles Arthur Bassett of the USAF were laid to rest. The committee, led by Chief Astronaut Alan Shepard, concluded that the T-38 aircraft had no mechanical problems and that C and Bassett were in optimal physical and psychological conditions. Both men had renewed their instrument flying certificates within the last six months. Both men were in excellent emotional conditions. There was no problem with them at all. Although the terrible weather was a contributory factor to the accident, the board concluded that pilot error was the biggest mistake that led to the crash. The committee indicated that C's attempt of not losing sight of the field carried them too slowly. The accident had more significant consequences than could be anticipated. Buzz Aldrin became Gemini 9's new backup pilot, and he eventually flew Gemini 12 in November 1966. If not for the accident, Aldrin would certainly not have been the lunar module pilot of Apollo 11, or the second man to walk on the moon alongside Armstrong in 1969. Stafford and Cernan moved on and made history after the crash. Stafford commanded the final dress rehearsal for the first lunar landing, and Cernan was the last man on the moon. Mm -hmm.